Hello friends, welcome back to Aloha Country Living. Today's topic is what to look for in a country property. If this topic interests you, be sure to subscribe so you can follow along as we develop our country property here in Hawaii. Also, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below and very soon we'll be making a Q&A video and we'll answer them. In this discussion, we're gonna be drawing from our own experience living off grid in Hawaii for the past 10 years as well as the counsels given in the Spirit of Prophecy books. So one of the first things we considered is population density. Population density is a measure of how many people live in a particular area. So it's measured in people per square mile. Typically, some parts of every state are very populated and other parts are not. So in the state of Hawaii, for example, in Oahu, the island of Oahu, there are over 1,600 people per square mile, and that is the population density. On this island, the island of Hawaii, the big island, this island has a population density that's currently 45 people per square mile. Hmm. Now, if you consider the two, that's over 36 times the population per square mile. So this is an important metric to consider. While there are no hard and fast rules, in general, you want to aim when comparing areas toward an area with the lowest population density possible. Um, we ultimately settled on an area with a population density of 16. So another thing to consider is distance from the city. Um, here on this island, we're fortunate not to have any major cities. The nearest one would be several islands away, approximately 210 miles. Um, however, on this Island, we do have some small cities in the neighborhood of approximately 45,000 people. Um, and so in the past, um, living on this island, we have lived as far as a far, an hour away from the city or the small city. However, um, more recently, we were looking at a minimum of 10 miles outside of this town or city. And um, we ended up settling on a place approximately half an hour away. So we wanted enough distance for city expansion over time, as well as for us to be able to commute to work, get needed groceries and supplies uh, during the development phase, etc. Yes, and be close enough to our church and be able to witness in town. All these things are important. So what are some of the other things to consider? Yeah, I would say when considering a country property, um, that probably the home itself is probably the, one of the last things that one should consider. Uh, in other words, if you find a property and it looks like the property is actually not great, but the home is great, um, I would consider look elsewhere because country living is a lot more than just country location. It is about um, independence. It's about um, reliance upon oneself and God. And there's a lot that goes into that. There's agriculture, there's generation of your own power, there's um, access to water. Mm -hmm. So there are many considerations. Um, the first thing that we really looked at was property suitability, suitability for agriculture. Yes. So thinking ahead, we know that um, that is perhaps paramount, right? Uh, secondary to distance from the city would be agriculture. And so there are many things that go into agriculture. In our particular area, um, we have to consider such things as um, climate. On this island, for example, there are 11 of the Earth's 13 climate zones. And so we have everything from snow-capped mountains to deserts to beaches to um, you know rainforest, tropical yeah. rainforests. So we've got a <laughs> lot of diversity here. And so you want to choose a climate that is suitable for agriculture. Also, and that comes with that comes elevation. Mm -hmm. um, here, one of the major limiting factors on what you can grow is how high your property is above sea level. And so that's a major factor. Then you have things like rainfall, soil quality, and um, also the slope of the property. Some properties that are, are more, are less gradual and more slopey, these are prone to erosion and as a result the topsoil is carried away and when that happens then you have um, some poor fertility issues you know it may make for dramatic views of the ocean like on the property where we live right now however um, with that you pay a price in 
your crops and your orchards not doing so well. So these are all important considerations. Yes, and I wanted to add, how do you find out about what grows in that area? You can talk to neighbors or you can just look at neighboring lots. What are they growing? How is it doing? Is it looking good, right? So um, there's you know many different ways to find out, but you can also Google. There are maps that show you you know where all these different um, climates are, right? You know where the elevation is um, that is suitable for agriculture. And nurseries, local nurseries can be yeah. a great help as well. Yes. So how about how much land? Well, for us here, we found that living in Hawaii that you can grow a tremendous amount of food in a relatively small area. Mm -hmm. And so an acre and a half was the minimum that we set when looking for land. Our previous homestead was about five acres. On that five acres, we had only developed about two acres before mm -hmm. the um, disaster. Um, and so as a result, we discovered that really you can do very, very well on a small air portion of land. That said, more land buys you more privacy mm -hmm. and more distance from your neighbors, and that's very valuable. And so we set this minimum of an acre and a half. We ended up purchasing 11 acres. Um, now, that said, also keep in mind that in the colder climates, we often hear country living um, experienced folks recommending properties of 10 acres or more. And that's largely to do with privacy, but also those that are needing renewable sources of, of firewood for mm -hmm. heating their homes. Um, and so that size helps them uh, in that particular area. Uh, of course, being here, um, heating is not a concern at all. And so we have uh, no need for the forested areas. So we can deal with a smaller portion of land. Yeah, so it's mostly about privacy and you know, what you can grow on that piece of land. Um, what else? Well, I mentioned this part earlier, but it's really quite important at least um, in our experience, it has been, and that is you want to get land that is either flat or gently sloping. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of, uh, in this region where we live, there's a lot of uh, water, right? There's a lot of streams, yes. there's a lot of waterfalls, there's all kinds of water running. And so as a result, um, there's a, quite a bit of erosion that's taken place. And so um, you've got to keep that in mind and you can you know, resolve those issues with the flat or gently sloping land, but also keep in mind, think ahead toward your old age, right? Mm -hmm. This is a long-term project. You're going to be establishing a piece of property that you would like to be able to enjoy the fruits of it. And should we still be here 20 years from now, and you may not have the vigor or strength that you have today, you'd like to still be able to get around and do what you need to do and enjoy that property and not feel like somehow it's you're, burden, yeah. it's a burden, yeah. Privacy. Yeah, so from the counsels that we've been given as well as our own experience, as well as common sense, if you look around at the world today, um, privacy is very important and it's becoming more and more important all the time. And so ideally you wanna get a piece of property that will give you enough space and you know if it doesn't have built-in privacy, you can always try to figure out um, some privacy that you can put in place. Um, here locally, that would mean podocarpus shrubs that become massive trees in short periods of, you know, a handful of years. Or things like here, we would use um, bananas and all kinds of things to just grow up and, and give us some space and privacy from the neighbors. And we have been given specific counsel to not live in areas where the houses are crowded closely together. Decent road access. The access to your property, whether that be county roads or whether that be private roads, whatever it is, you've got to make sure that it's going to be suitable for your needs. Yeah. And um, you know, everybody's needs may be a little different if people have access to different kinds of vehicles, etc. But you've just got mm -hmm. to really consider that. Yeah, so um, you either have to have a good road or a good vehicle. Yeah, and if you don't, you've got to figure out, is that property worth the amount of money you're going to have to put into that road yeah. um, to make it what it needs to be? So that's There was a property that we looked at and, and it was a, quite a good price and it was uh, very tempting to get it, but the access to it was through some um, gulches, right? And there was no actual um, bridge or anything. You have to go through the actual gulch where the, sometimes the water is high up. And so, 
if we considered it and we decided we probably don't want to have to drive like that to our house. So the next thing we looked at was sunshine. And sunshine is really important for a lot of reasons. You want to purchase a place where cloud cover is not dominant, where you have access to sunshine for as much of the year as possible. And you need that for a couple of reasons. Number one, for independent power generation, which would mean solar power uh, panels. Mm -hmm. um, and also food production also for food production so you're gonna have some agriculture you're gonna have trees you're gonna be growing um, gardens and those are really going to rely upon the Sun mm -hmm. for um, fruit, food production and so your food production and your power production could be significantly less if you happen to not have enough Sun in your location Yes, and another important point is you want to consider your mental health because without sunshine, you know, most people feel very gloomy and it's not a good environment to live in. So for us, it was very important, especially I'm a stay-at-home mom and I stay at home most of the time with my kids. I wanted to be able to be most of the time in the sunshine and be happy most of the time, right? Here in Hawaii, as you move away from the ocean up the slopes of the mountains, um, Typically, the, sun, the higher up you go, the, the less sunshine you have, the more cloud cover you have. And so for us, that meant the need to stay closer toward the ocean for the sunshine, for the lower elevation, which enables us to grow more crops, etc. Yeah, it's really a fine balance to try to be not too close to the ocean, not too close to the highway, yet to be not too far away that you're just living in the clouds. The next point is rainfall. Rainfall is key. It's absolutely key. You're relying upon this to pretty much grow whatever it is you need to grow in addition to beautify and keep nature all green around you. Now, so in certain portions of the island, we have um, whole districts and areas that have rainfall of approximately like three to 10 inches of rain a year. And those places just look like deserts and there is very little potential to grow anything, even if you have a well. In other areas of the island and the state, you can have a rainfall in excess of 250, um, even 300 inches a year, which, you know, when you start going above a certain amount, like let's just say, I would say probably 150 inches a year, you're gonna have issues with, let's say, your, your crops tasting watery, your, your fruits not tasting sweet, um, things not really thriving and wanting to grow. Yeah. And so, you know, you want to find enough water, I would say be, would be the problem that most people would be working toward. Make sure you have sufficient amount of water. Mm -hmm. And um, for some of us, we just have to be careful not to have too, too, much. too much water. I mean, this is rainforest after all. <laughs> yeah. So I, I um, you know, I'm not an expert on mainland growing conditions. But I do know that when we lived in Tennessee, East Tennessee, we had an average of 50 inches a year, and that was very suitable. Yeah. Um, here on this island so far, in our different locations, we've had between 90 and 150 inches a, a year, mm -hmm. and that's been ample. And so we're certainly blessed with that. Yes, and we of course use rainfall here to have water for all of our needs. Yeah, and that's actually um, something I had left off, which was, um, rainwater harvesting is, is kind of the lifeblood of many uh, country properties here in the state of Hawaii. Um, there are al also options of wells as, as long as you are in an area where you can drill. Um, yes, and we actually have a video on that if you're curious how that works and we'll link it up above. Let's see, the next thing is breezes, trade winds and airflow. So airflow is really important, and one of the ways that you can accomplish that, of course, is to make sure that the area around your home site is cleared enough that the breezes can come in. Um, typically here in Hawaii, if you can see the ocean, then the ocean has an unobstructed path to you as far as breezes go. Here we have a lot of humidity, but most of the time we don't feel any of it, and that's largely due to the trade winds. It's very important that we uh, kind of capitalize on that and so we typically will position the home in such a way as to capture the breezes and that actually is more than sufficient for most people to entirely um, provide for the needs of cooling the home. 
and so no need for air conditioning. Of course, if you get into a, a, a residential area and everybody's fences and homes are sort of blocking everybody else's path um, to the, the ocean trade winds, then, then of course that's a different story. But, yeah, um, and there was a property, I remember, that we looked at, remember? We called it the Mosquito Jungle? Yeah. Well, we looked at this property and one of the biggest things that prevented us from buying it was it was just a rainforest and there were a lot of big trees that would be very difficult and very expensive to remove. And even if we would remove all the trees, we couldn't see the ocean or we couldn't even feel the breezes coming through and we knew it would be just a muggy, wet kind of environment and that's not where we wanted to live at. Right, and in the absence of um, these winds or breezes, um, you're going to have mold problems, especially yes. in high humidity areas like Hawaii. Yes, and that reminds me um, of some counsel from Spirit of Prophecy that she says we should not live in um, kind of low-lying areas. We want it to be more on the hill, more on top. We want to have enough airflow, enough sunshine, right? She says every room should have windows, you know, we should have um, plenty of sunshine going in. Um, you don't want to live in these low-lying lands in swampy areas where you get a lot of mold, which is going to create disease. So that's very important. Now let's talk about homeowner associations. So our opinion on homeowners associations is um, to avoid them, really. So what they are is these are local groups, community groups, neighborhood associations that essentially want to um, be involved in all of your decisions that you make related to your property. Yeah. And so it is best to avoid them. We want freedom in the country. We want the ability to, to live according to our conscience and of course, according to the laws of the land, but we don't need additional uh, impedance to us developing our homestead. Um, in a similar manner, you know, we wanna be careful about Covenants, codes, and restrictions, CCs and Rs. When we're looking at a property, you want to find out, do they have HOAs with fees? Do they have um, CC and Rs? And so, um, for example, the property that we purchased, um, we discovered that it did have CC and Rs, and we were, we were quite concerned about that until we got a copy of the CC and Rs. There's no HOA, but there is covenants, codes, and restrictions. And when this neighborhood was developed uh, approximately 20 years ago, um, they put in place a few rules that were just simply meant to safeguard the community. And fortunately, fortunately for us, they were actually very reasonable. Mm -hmm. There were probably three or four rules um, and they included everybody, um, you know, build with permits, which is actually the law of the, of the state of Hawaii anyhow. Um, and they mentioned uh, no pig farms mm -hmm. and basically no fighting rooster ranches. Mm -hmm. And so we figured, whoa, that- We can do that. <laughs> we, can, we can do that. And so, um, and that was in our best interest. So just make sure that you're aware of what it is you're signing up for. Yeah, and I don't think those things can change, right? So once they're set, it's kind of set in stone. Um, let's see, phone and internet access, those are important things. Yeah, so you probably want to consider when you're looking at your property, what kind of access do you have to phone and internet? You might have a cell signal and that might be a blessing, as long as, of course, the cell tower is not right next door to you. Um, but um, do you have access to what you need as far as phone and internet, whether that be landline or otherwise? For us here in rural Hawaii, we're pretty much dependent upon satellite internet. Um, and that can be kind of expensive, so you just have to sort of factor that in um, we're paying somewhere around $120 um, a month right. for internet. And it's also kind of slow, but you know, these are just little sacrifices we have to make to be in the country. Ideally, you want to live in an area where you're not the only person who's independent for the necessities of life. Right. In other words, you don't want to be the only person who has large gardens and orchards. Right. Um, so if you can see that your neighbors are also, um, have built some resiliency into their lives, they have some agriculture going on, etc. Um, that's a real plus. Yes, because when the crisis comes, you know, and you're the only one who has food, guess where everybody's going to go? Yeah, and so we're all we're always happy to share, but you don't want your own supplies to be wiped out by thieves or otherwise. Yeah. Right, I mean, it's, it's all about safety too. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the things to avoid? Yeah, so we already mentioned that we're going to avoid low-lying areas. Right. Um, 
We're also going to avoid land needing expensive improvements. Mm -hmm. um, at least you're going to want to really know about that and do your due diligence as to what it's going to cost before you sign on the dotted line. Uh, so these would be, for example, we found that one property mm -hmm. where we determined that to clear out these invasive trees was going to cost approximately $100,000 in bulldozing and etc. And we decided not to mess with that. Right. Um, others, we have a neighbor not too far from us now, the property we purchased, um, who invested approximately $120,000 in um, trying to make an access over a stream. And so they had to put in a culvert and create sort of a roadway. And some of those things can be very, very expensive. So yeah. be aware of what you're getting um, into. Landlocked. What yes. does that mean? So um, you want to just um, make sure that you have legal access to the property. Mm -hmm. And so if your property is not bordering a county road or something like that, uh, do you actually have legal access to, to get there? Is there a... Is there an easement, for example, where you can drive through the neighbor's property? Mm -hmm. Or um, is your property landlocked? Maybe through some verbal agreement, the previous owner was able to access the property through the neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, however, maybe they won't extend that to you or maybe they'll change their mind when that property sells. And so make sure you have legal access. Another thing is to avoid natural hazard zones. Right, so the, the, the most common application of this would be flood zones. You're going to want to look at the FEMA flood site uh, and look at their maps and see is the area you're considering purchasing, is it at risk of flooding? Uh, that's something important. Here in, in East Hawaii or at least on the island of Hawaii, um, lava hazard zones are a consideration. Yeah. And so, we know all about that. Yeah. <laughs> so these are some things to take into consideration. A couple of things we didn't worry too much about was access to traditional power. And so here locally, we do have a power company. However, it's very, very expensive to run those power lines to the property that you're looking to purchase. Um, sometimes even short distances can cost a large amounts of money. Yes. Um, we're talking about, you know, 15, 20, $30,000 to run power lines, not very far at all. And so you could put that same amount of money into a solar power system with batteries and charge controller, yeah inverter, etc., and you could be free of power bills yes. and maybe just have to change the batteries out once every seven to 10 years, depending on what kind of uh, batteries you've purchased. Yes, and that reminded me of that um, hurricane season we had one time, or hurricane actually, that came to our area, and we experienced firsthand how wonderful it is to be independent as far as solar and um, energy because everybody around us was just out of power for like three weeks, I think. It, it was, was, it was, it was a, a very long time. And when that happened, when that hurricane came, we actually had no idea what happened until we started driving or trying to drive to town and found you know, all these trees um, on the road. But we basically went back home and we had everything working just fine. Right, and these days there are systems, some, some fancy hybrid systems, where if you, for example, purchased a property that already had a home and perhaps it was already connected to the grid, mm -hmm. you can install solar um, backup systems mm -hmm. where you just flip the switch and, um, and then you can be on your yeah. own. That's another way. One of our friends did that. Yeah. City water. Should we worry about that? Yeah, I'd say not so much because um, you just want to make sure that you have an alternative, right? Mm -hmm. And so can you put in a well? What's that going to cost you? before you purchase the property, um, it would be wise to get an estimate. A lot of times it can just be done even without a site inspection. They can give you a ballpark like, hey, we've put in wells in that area. We know that it's roughly like this. You know, I I'm just saying that you should have a plan in place for how you're gonna do your water. You can do um, rainwater harvesting, which works very well here, um, and, um, but doesn't work so well in some of the drier areas. Now, how about mainland? Can people in mainland do um, rainwater harvesting? In most, or is it illegal? In most states you can. There are some states that have actually moved, or at least counties in states, moved to outlaw rainwater harvesting mm -hmm. um, for environmental reasons. They said that you should just let the rain go where it goes and not try to capture it. Um, but um, in most places it's still um, a viable option. 
So that's about the end of the list that we came up with today. However, um, in closing, we'd like to share a couple reminders. So country living is really about many things, but one aspect of it is providing for the necessities of life, providing for our family. Mm -hmm. And so thinking ahead mm -hmm. to a time when there will be no buying or selling for those who are faithful to God and keep his commandments. Yes. And so it's important that we realize what are some of the basic necessities of life. This is about water, mm -hmm food, shelter and warmth, and also personal safety. And so we wanna make sure that when we're selecting a country property, that we can take care of these necessities of life on that property and that we have a plan on how to do that. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 13 in verse 17 that there is a time coming when no man will buy or sell save he that had the mark. And so we are moving toward that time. No one knows exactly how soon it will arrive. However, now is the time for us to make physical, mental, spiritual preparation. Unfortunately, those who don't will find themselves in a difficult situation. Imagine in the cold of winter, not being able to provide for the needs of your family. You're not allowed to work. You're not allowed to buy or to sell. You don't have food. You don't have uh, clothing to keep your family warm. What are you going to be tempted to do? You're going to be tempted to comply with these unjust laws to, in order to take care of the needs of your family. And that is what God is protecting us from when he has given us warning in advance. He has told us that this is coming and he's advised us to prepare. Think about Noah. God warned him of what was coming and told him to prepare. Think about Joseph when God told him that there's seven years of famine coming. It's time for you to prepare. And so it was no denial of faith. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, it speaks of Noah mm -hmm. as being by faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, prepared an ark for the saving of his house. I want to read a quotation from the Spirit of Prophecy. This comes from Prophets and Kings, page 184, paragraph 2. We read that human laws will be made so stringent that men and women will not dare to observe the seventh day Sabbath. For fear of wanting food and clothing, they will join with the world in transgressing God's law. So keep in mind, friends, that those who do not follow the counsel, who do not heed God's warning and make preparation, they're going to be put in difficult positions where they're going to fear they're not going to have the basic necessities of life. And as a result, they are going to be severely tempted and many of them will cave in and do what they know is wrong just to provide for the necessities of their family. That need not be you. That need not be me. If we heed God's warning and we, we take action now, we can provide for the necessities of life. And when the time comes for us to take our stand, it will be much easier at that time for us to do. Yes. And in the end times, you don't want to be part of the problem. You want to be part of the solution, right? So um, you don't want to be wanting food and clothing. You want to be sharing what you have, what you've prepared with others. When many people think ahead to this time, we're focused on evangelism, sharing God's message, um, warning, helping others in need. They'll be sick, etc. However, we need to realize that if we are in dire need, how will we help others in need? If we have no food, how will we help others, whether it be through evangelism, um, medical missionary work, etc.? We can't. God's missionary team must have what they need so that they can supply themselves and their own families and then go out or continue going out mm -hmm. and sharing his message. Yes, and we want to also leave you with a special promise that God made to his people in finding these kind of properties. I know it's very difficult and as you know it took us a long time and I know some of you are still looking but God has a promise for you that he will help you. In the book Adventist Home page 139 we read God will help his people find such homes outside, outside of the cities. cities. Well friends we really hope that this video was helpful to you we hope you learned something new we hope it was encouraging to you and we would like to leave you with some more resources about country living. So go ahead and check out the description down below. We'll probably put some sermons about country living or some more resources and links to um, ministries that were helpful to us. 
Again, if you're interested in this topic, go ahead and subscribe. As always, if you have more questions for us, leave them in the comments below and we hope to see you next time. Aloha and God bless.